Now I'd like to introduce you to a new type of analysis called the analysis of variance. This is abbreviated as ANOVA. And we're going to start by talking about the need for this ANOVA, analysis of variance, using three independent groups. So let's say that we've done some kind of study where we compare people who work out a little bit to people who work out a lot. And these are just made up numbers, but let's say we've compared people who exercise five hours a week over people who exercise for two hours a week. And let's say we find out that there's not a difference between those two. So what does this mean? There's no point in working out that exercise doesn't really help improve your health. Maybe what we have is some kind of ceiling effect where you get a benefit early on, but adding increasing amounts of strenuous activity doesn't lead to a corresponding amount of improvement in health outcomes. Maybe there's a minimum that we need to hit, but you can either overdo it or there's a law of diminishing returns. So how could we test that? What we would need to do is add a control group. We could compare people who don't exercise at all to people who exercise a little bit, let's say two hours a week, to people who exercise a lot, let's say five hours a week. And we want to know if there is a change in their health outcomes based on how much they exercise. What I want you to see here is we have three groups. We randomly assign people to the no exercise group, the small amount of exercise group, and the large amount of exercise group, and then we compare their overall health outcomes as the result of the amount of exercise that they do. Well, if we have a t-test, we can compare two means. But in our example, with our three groups, we have three means. Well, how can we fix that? I guess one thing we could do is just use a lot of t-tests, but that creates a real problem. See, what we could do is take our three groups, A, B, and C, and we could run a t-test comparing A to B. But when we did that, we would have an alpha of 0 0.05, which means we would have a 5% chance of making a type one error. We'd run a second t-test comparing B to C, and again, the alpha would be set at 0 0.05. A third t-test would compare A to C, also with a 0 0.05 chance of getting a type 1 error. So each of these three t-tests would have a 0 0.05 error rate, or alpha level. Let me explain why this is a problem using a lottery analogy. So imagine that you're going to play the lottery, which is something that I don't particularly recommend because the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. In fact, I always chuckle. I find it a little cynical when states say that they're going to have a state lottery and give the money to education. Because if the education worked, people wouldn't be playing the lottery. Once you know something about probability, you realize that your best bet is to put that money into a savings account where you'll still have it. Even if you earned no interest on that money that you would have spent in the lottery, you'll still have the money that you would have spent. Okay, enough of that. Let's go back to my lottery analogy. Let's say we have a really special lottery. The, the prize for this lottery is $10,000, but only 20 tickets are going to be sold. And the tickets cost $10 a piece. So my question is, what would you do in this circumstance? Well, if you're smart, what you would do is buy all 20 tickets. You'd spend $200, but you'd win $10,000. That's a no-brainer. Buy up all of the tickets. Now, which one of those tickets would win? You don't know. It doesn't matter. One of those 20 tickets is going to win regardless of whether you can predict the outcome or at the outset which one it's going to be, you know that one of them is going to be a winner. Now, the same logic applies with hypothesis testing. Imagine that we do 20 t-tests, each one having a 0 0.05 chance of a type 1 error. What do you think is going to happen over time? One of those t-tests is going to be an error. One of them is going to be a mistake. One will be a type 1 error. And which one will it be? You don't know. 
you can't predict. And you can't even find out post hoc. All you know is that if you run enough tests, you are going to make an error. And this is called the problem of probability pyramiding. When you do multiple t-tests on the same data, your alpha level just skyrockets because every time you reject the null hypothesis, that alpha level becomes multiplied. In fact, if you were comparing five groups, each of which was different than the other, so we rejected the null five times, your functional alpha level would rise to about a 0 0.40. In other words, real close to that 50-50 flip of a coin something has to be wrong. There has to be a type 1 error in there somewhere, and you won't know where it is. So the reason we can't use multiple t-tests is because using multiple t-tests is going to lead us to type 1 errors. We have to use a different form of analysis, and that is where the analysis of variance comes in. The advantage of the ANOVA is that it will allow us to test three or more groups controlling for that problem of probability pyramiding. So analysis of variance is abbreviated as ANOVA. There are other forms of this general linear model that include things like a covariate. This would be an analysis of covariance or ANCOVA. Then we could have multivariate analysis of variance. Using multiple variables, that would be a MANOVA. And if we threw in a covariate, we could have a MANCOVA. These are all variations on a theme. The first step along this way is learning about how to do a simple ANOVA comparing three or maybe four groups. So an ANOVA can be used when you have more than one independent variable. If you were comparing men and women on a test of math and another test of science. We can do all of those together and control for our type 1 errors. So the ANOVA is an extension of the general linear model or the GLM-1.